Hi there, this is uh, an introduction to online teaching course and this is the first of three videos we're doing. It's a condensed version of the videos we do in our one week intensive course, but I just thought I would try to bring them into a seven or eight minute video and see if we can't get this down so people can refer back to it. The first and most important point in this whole process is that the online pivot, this idea of moving to the internet and how we switch our teaching to an online space, is not a technology problem. It's not an issue of which buttons to press and how you click on that button, change that setting. While those things are relevant and important, that's not really where we need to start. So my argument is that what we need to do is start thinking conceptually about what the internet is, what it means to be online, and how that impacts how you can go about teaching and learning. We've had a lot of faculty go through our introductory course at this point. And inevitably, at the beginning, people have this sense that what their job is to try to take what they do in their face-to-face -face classrooms and move them to the internet in some way. And I mean, I totally get that. Your face-to-face -face classrooms are probably super successful. And you've been working on them for years, you've tweaked them, you've made them better. And I mean, the desire to want to go ahead and continue to do that is something I completely understand. But at the end of the day, the internet's just a different space. It runs by different rules. There are things you can do there you totally can't do in a face-to-face -face classroom, and there are things you can do in a face-to-face -face classroom you will not get away with online. And so today we're gonna to talk about three concepts that when brought together, hopefully give you sort of a basis for understanding how the internet impact, impacts the process of teaching online. The first one of those is the distinction between things that are complicated and things that are complex. And I've been using this example for years, and I understand that people have other ways of using the word complicated and complex. This comes from Dave Snowden's Kinevin framework, and it's really just a way of separating the different kinds of things that you might wanna teach and how those different kinds of things impact you in an online situation. So things that are complicated are step-by-step. -step. They respond to a copy and paste process. There's something where you could go out and any given person inside a field would broadly agree on what the answer to that question is or what that information is. And also from a learning perspective, you, you really want people to follow a step-by-step -step process. So this, this example of an airplane and how an airplane comes together is one of those things that, that I like to think about whenever we talk about what it means uh, to have a complicated process. I don't want a single person on this floor to be creative. I don't want them coming up with new ideas. I don't want them attaching the wings in a way that's more clever. I want everybody to do the job that's been set out for them, go through that step-by-step -step process. Whatever, if they're at step 4,322 through 24, I want them doing those steps and doing them in order. And there are lots of things that we do in a teaching and learning perspective that respond to that. There are lots of things that it's important to take that step-by-step, -step, to understand that basic information, to have the generally accepted definition that people use so you can move on to learning different kinds of things. So when we look at a complicated problem like that, uh, they're easier to measure. So I can check whether or not you followed the steps. I can go back and did you put those rivets in and did that happen? Um, it may be more than one way of doing it, but everybody in the field would generally accept what those different ways are. And we're looking at a step-by-step step -step process. Those complicated issues respond really well to that kind of controlled classroom environment where I can ask you, did you remember the thing I told you to remember? You can tell me and I can tell whether or not you've remembered it, right? It solves um, working in a lab. There's all kinds of issues. And I always think the one that I always go back to is my times tables. Do I memorize them? I do. Do I use them all the time? Yes, I do. Am I glad I have them memorized? Absolutely. Nobody's gonna argue with me that 12 times 12 is 144. Just remember it and get it done. There's a whole other suite of issues that I that this Kinevin framework talks about as being complex. Those are things that don't have an obvious solution. If you're gonna deal with that issue, you're only gonna be able to deal with a small part of it at a problem, and you're gonna to have to work through that problem and solve bits and pieces of it at a time. So when I look at this painting and I ask you the question, how's, our, how's the man doing in terms of his ability to, let's say, impress this woman? Well, some of you might say, well, she is smiling, but her body language would certainly imply that maybe she is not having a good time. And when we talk about ways in order to sort of make this process better, we might say, oh, you know what? Don't shove that loot in her face. Maybe that'll make her happier. Uh, maybe you should have asked permission before you sat down and started singing. Maybe the shoes are part of the problem. But you're only going to be able to work on one of those issues at a time. There's no step-by-step -step process to impressing this person that is something we can just hand to him and also, at the same time, we can't go back and go, 
hey, you got 76% better on your loot playing, so now that's gonna have this level of improvement. It doesn't respond to Lean Six Sigma. It doesn't respond to things because there's no clear objective. So there's all kinds of ways in which learning is like that, and our lives are like that too. So I don't measure how much I love somebody. It's not a percentage. It's something I work on. It's something we work on together, right? And a lot of things like that are like that. So complex problems are not directly measurable. They don't have a clear definition or a solution, and you can only work on part of that problem. When we look at that from a learning perspective, a complex issue, um, when you try to do it in a face-to-face -face classroom, you may break people out, you may look for people's opinions and their perspectives, but it's hard to get everybody's complex perspective from them when everybody's talking at the same time in a face-to-face -face classroom. In an online space, it's much easier to actually get complex responses from people because they're coming in asynchronously. They're coming in in a discussion forum, in an assignment, and those come in in a nice orderly fashion in a way that allows people to have different perspectives and different opinions. Whereas a complicated or fact-based answer online, I can just go out, copy and paste that thing, come in, and you're not gonna be able to tell whether or not I remembered it or whether or not I had some help in remembering it. So I think that distinction between complicated and complex can be really important when we start talking about learning and it gives us some perspective in terms of how we're gonna go ahead and learn on the internet. Because the internet is inherently a complex place. It's also deeply collaborative. I mean, I don't only mean that in a good way. It's deeply collaborative in the sense that lots of people are trying to provide answers to lots of different kinds of questions. There's no clear sense from the internet's perspective about who's right, what it means for them to be right. Um, and so if you go out to the internet looking for an answer, you're gonna get lots and lots and lots of people who are gonna try through either their web presence or the content they have out there to answer your question. And trying to get through that process is gonna be a complex one. Whereas if I go to a textbook, the answer in there is the one for the whole classroom that we've agreed is the answer. May not provide a full context, but it definitely provides that kind of authority that we've all agreed on. So again, complicated and complex are a nice term to use in terms of uh, thinking about what we're doing online. The second concept that intersects with that is the distinction between scarcity and abundance. So particularly in terms of how it relates to information. So in 1974, um, Dr. I uh, wrote this article and suggested that we were getting to the point where information was now abundant that a given person couldn't know all of the things about their field because there's simply too much of it out there. And that's in 1974, right? The argument that I would make is that at this point, certainly, we've reached a point where information is abundant. For a long time, the solution that we were solving with our education process was solving the problem of scarcity. People didn't have access to the information. They couldn't get to that information. And so what we were trying to do was provide a place and a model and a process that allowed people to get that information and find a way to keep it, sometimes just inside of their heads, so they could use it later on. So Seymour Papert, uh, to me, is one of the, the he's one of the founders of the field of educational technology, so-called, but has also did a lot of the preliminary work that a lot of the work that we do now is based upon. But back in the in the mid 70s, 1976 to 80, when he was writing about what technology could do to support learning he was talking about a knowledge machine, right? This idea that you could go in to this machine and it could give you the answer to a question. How fantastic would it be if you could have a machine that did that? I mean, I always think of the comparison to the Encyclopedia Britannica that my parents saved up for and bought and then I threw out two years ago because I literally couldn't imagine what I would do with it anymore. When we got it in the 70s, it was a pathway to information that we just didn't have in any other way. Right, I could find out, I still remember reading the Addis Ababa entry and realizing that the capital of, that was the capital of Ethiopia and that it had a super long history that was really kind of amazing, right? But for Papper, he had this idea that, you know, a little girl would want to know whether or not giraffes slept lying down. Like she could literally go in, ask the knowledge, knowledge machine and get the answer to that question. So he was trying to solve that problem of scarcity of information with the knowledge machine. And I think to some degree, a lot of our early thoughts about the way we could teach online was using it as that knowledge machine, as something that answered that question that we wanted to ask. And for Papert, that built on his own beliefs that 
what people really needed was access to the kinds of things he'd had as a kid that allowed him to form his own beliefs about his own idea of possibilities right so he had a i think it was an uncle who gave him a set of gears that for him were really a formative um, piece of development that allowed him to understand potential and how things work together and how machines worked and he really wanted to provide that same access um, that he had as a kid it's a laudable goal so when we think about those electronic textbooks they were really designed to solve the problem of scarcity right so same as a paper textbook how do we get all this information about first year physics into one place do we grab all the bits of articles and chop them up and glue them together no we have a textbook that we can carry around that's a great solution to the problem of scarcity. Um, but we've passed that point in our culture, right? And this is from a 2010 interview. Um, we create as much information in two days now as we did from the dawn of man, so-called, through 2003. And that's 17 years ago, right? 10 years ago and up to 17 years ago. We've just reached the point where we have tons and tons and tons and tons of information. Then you have to ask yourself, What's our purpose as an education system once we pass through that idea of scarcity to that idea of abundance, right? Because information abundance, it changes, it changes the model, right? We're suddenly no longer asking the question, how do I help people find one piece of information? We're saying, we know those people are confronted with thousands of pieces of information. How do they focus through that process? How do they deal with the fire hose? How do they identify of the many things that are out there, the things that they need and how do they combine those with other things in order to be able to effectively solve whatever problem they're working on. Too often, I think, what we've done is we've created this model of artificial scarcity. We have this cone of scarcity in our face-to-face -face classrooms where we have people turn off their laptops, we have them turn off their phones, and we say, okay, stay in this narrow scarcity piece because it allows us to keep doing what we were doing before. It allows us to keep solving the problem of scarcity by having a controlled environment with a textbook and some resources that we're doing. And we're gonna use these resources and we're gonna do these assignments. And by following this method, we can still keep teaching the way we were before. That's gonna work in a face-to-face -face classroom where you can actually create that space of artificial scarcity. But in our education system, like I said, is designed for that scarcity. And our measurements often are also designed for the same level of scarcity, right? So what we have is we restrict the amount of content coming in, and then we go ahead and measure whether or not you have performed to that restricted model that we had at the beginning with, right? So we create artificial scarcity that allows us to measure what you've exactly done. But the digital just is different. So where you can control that level of scarcity in a face-to-face -face classroom, you simply can't do it on the internet, right? If somebody is at home working on an assignment, you can't stop them from reaching out and finding other information. But the question you've got to ask yourself is, is that really what you want to do, right? Do you want to restrict them from accessing the information that allows them to solve a problem? Or is it time to start redesigning the way that we ask those questions, right? So if I am working uh, at my house on a project in my backyard, I have access to all of the internet to be able to help me to do that. Now, finding what I need can be a real struggle. Finding whether or not I should trust that, a real struggle, but getting access to that information is not a problem. The same is true for most of us in all of our work lives now. When somebody says, hey, how do I do this? Or says, hey, can you go do this for me? We have the ability to go out and find that information in most cases, but those tools are sometimes lagging behind, right? We haven't developed the practices we need. And the argument here is that shouldn't we be developing those practices as people learn inside of our field? So just a couple of quick things about the digital and how it is different. So we were talking to some language learning profs the other day who were talking about seek and scan, right? So the fact that you can use control F or command F on a Mac on any document, on any website, the fact that you can search Google at all fundamentally changes what it means to go and look for information, whether that's in a document or across various documents, right? Just that one change is fundamental in the way that we interact with information. 
copy and paste is another example. So if you're in a classroom and you're inside that artificial cone of scarcity and somebody says, do you remember enough about the downfall of the Roman Empire to talk, the Roman Republic to talk about Caesar's influence in it? Well, if you did your studying and you read the articles you were supposed to and the perspective on that you were supposed to, then maybe you can perform that inside of a test. If you ask that question to somebody while they're at home and say, what did happen, right? They're going to be able to go out onto Wikipedia and a hundred other places and get the answer to that question. If you ask the question, what do you think happened and how does that reflect, how does that connection work with something else that you've talked about? If you ask a personal question in that way, then that copy and paste isn't going to work. They're still going to go out onto Google and find out the actual facts of the matter, but the facts aren't the point of your question anymore. So as long as your questions don't respond to copy and paste, if you can't imagine copying and pasting an answer, then you probably design that question in a way that's going to work. So this is the first of three videos that are um, trying to give some context for moving online. Um, hopefully you get a chance to see the other two. Take care now.